things that members of Congress do that are high points and, and give, give them relief from the, uh, from the do-nothingness of Congress. And incidentally, the do-nothingness of Congress is not new. I mean, we can go back in history, and I won't bore you with those details, uh, but throughout history, if you, were to, if you were to do a survey of news articles, do-nothing Congress or its equivalent are throughout, throughout the news. So how do, how do you, how do you uh, uh, as a member of Congress, how do you, and you're on a mission, how do you express yourself in, a, in that kind of an environment? It's very frustrating. Very frustrating. Well, uh, there are some little devices that are used. One is uh, a thing called a caucus. Uh, while the formal rules of the Congress uh, dictate what committees can do, what jurisdictions they have, how they operate, da 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 da. Uh, caucuses are uh, 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 organizations that are much freer. They're invented by members of Congress coming together with a common interest and expressing themselves through the, and they, if they're not on a committee that deals with agriculture, they can have an agriculture caucus and they can join it and they can have all kinds of activities. The caucuses today are not the caucuses of yesteryear. Before, before Newt Gingrich came in, we had caucuses that were real caucuses. They had staff. Um, you couldn't join up with every, they weren't a sign-up sheet. You couldn't, you just, I mean, you, you couldn't sign on to a caucus without contributing money from your personal office account to that staff. That isn't the case today. Today, it's all just the sign-up sheets. But still, it is an effort to, um, to be uh, a little more free form outside the constraints of how the Congress is organized. So ask your members of Congress in profile, what caucuses are they members of? Some of the caucuses they're members of will be because they're really, really, really interested in that. And there's no constituency in their district for that. That's why you have to know a little bit about their districts. Uh, if you're from an ag district and your member says, I'm on the ag caucus, well, duh. That's like, uh, you know, if, if maybe that member's from an ag district is not on the ag committee and has to have something that kind of speaks to what the district's all about. And they may have joined that caucus just because somebody asked them to. They don't have to, like I said, they don't have, it, it does you, you can sign up for every caucus if you want. It doesn't cost anything. So caucus memberships are, are, are easy. But you know, if you look at all the caucuses that your profile member is, is on, and some don't have anything to do with their, their, uh, their constituency, um, you're probably beginning to look inside their mind. What are they really kind of interested in? What are the kinds of things? You know, it's like asking somebody, what, when you read the newspaper, where do your eyeballs, or not the newspaper, if you're looking at the screen, if you're looking at the news, whatever you're looking at. What are your eyeballs, what are your eyeballs attracted to? What's the story that you read that has nothing to do with your job, has nothing to do with your family, has nothing to do with nothing, you just are interested in it? Well, asking the questions about the caucuses and why is one area to get a, a little richer profile. Now, I was the chair of the, of the, um, the Arts Caucus. For four years, I was the chair of the Arts Caucus. And what a wonderful experience that was. I got to meet, you know, I got a picture in my, uh, that I absolutely love. A uh, picture of uh, uh, of me with uh, <laughs> Dolly Parton. Uh, Suzanne Summers, um, uh, Downey, uh, what, what's the woman, I, I'm, I'm Sarah Jessica Parker, I'm, I, I mean I had an opportunity to meet a lot of people, it was, it was a lot of fun. I was, I was not a chair of a committee, uh, I wasn't on anything that had to do with arts and entertainment, uh, I was interested in uh, protecting intellectual property and supporting funding for the endowment for the arts. Uh, in humanities. I have one picture where I'm standing between Billy Joel and Christy Brinkley. And Christy Brinkley is tall. And 
And Billy Joel is short. And every time I looked at that picture, I used to say, she needs a taller man. <laughs> Those took your advice? <laughs> yeah, later on, she had a problem. But I mean, it, you know, <coughs> when you're a member of Congress, you know, ask the question, what does your member of Congress uh, do for fun? What is it that sort of uh, <coughs> gets a smile on their face? Um, and and the Arts Caucus was one of those things for me. We did a lot of we did a lot of important things. It wasn't all frivolous, but we did very serious things. I remember one of the one of the days I remember uh, even the most. I in my world or many world, if I could have been anything but a congressman, I'd have been a songwriter. I do play the piano poorly, um, and I really admire uh, people who can put lyrics to music. And does this have anything to do with my history? Have anything to do with Vietnam and civil? No, this is uh, me. I just like it, and I would love to have been a songwriter. So one day, as chairman of the Arts Caucus, I managed to convince BMI and ASCAP, the two licensing uh, uh, groups for um, songwriters, to hold a what's really called, I guess, an audition session or a workshop on Capitol Hill. We took over the rape, we took over the Cannon uh, Caucus Room in the, in the Cannon Building, and there were uh, the likes of uh, Hal David, uh, Mike Reed. Uh, these are names that maybe don't mean anything to you, but they're famous composers. Hal David, what the world needs now. Uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and Mike Reed, who was a former Cincinnati Bengal who left to write songs in Nashville. He, he left an NFL career to write songs in Nashville. He, I'm trying to think of the one he did. His, his most famous song was um, Stranger in My House or something like that. Many of them country. Anyway. These two organizations brought songwriters to Washington, D.C., Ken Caucus Room, and for hours auditioned new songwriters. And it was fabulous. I got so much satisfaction out of doing that. I mean, because I was having trouble getting satisfaction, job satisfaction, you know, dealing with the ordinary time constraints of day to day life in, in the Congress. So, um, that was one high point, and, and others. I was I was at the signing of the Salt Agreement. I was in, I was appointed by Carter as a, an advisor to the Salt negotiations in Geneva. And I was at the Salt signing in Vienna with Carter and Brezhnev. He introduced me. You know, President Carter introduced me to President Brezhnev for the first time. <laughs> Doesn't happen very often. You know, that you get psychic income from these kinds of things. You want to ask the member that you're profiling, where do they get their psychic? Because after a while, people calling you congressman doesn't give you the psychic income. <laughs> you mean it doesn't. It just sort of rolls off your back. There's got to be something in the job that keeps you coming back. There's got to be something there that keeps you running again. Because running and campaigns and all that stuff can be really, can be drudgerous. It's boring sometimes. I hate to tell you this, and they, they won't tell you this. but. It is boring to go to town meeting after town meeting after town meeting after town meeting because all the questions repeat themselves. It's very, very, you've got to go through a dozen town meetings before you get a new challenging question. And almost none of the questions sort of get your intellectual juices going. It's all public relations. Well, anyway, uh, I'm, I'm talking too much about too many details, I think. Uh, what, what else should I talk about? were on a number of fascinating committees, um, including being an appropriator, yeah. being on transportation, and being on, on services. Tell us about some of your, your committees. Well, the committees are, are, are where you gain your, your expertise, if you didn't have it to begin with. That's where you sit in hearings after hearings after hearings and learn fabulous, fabulous things. I'll tell you one little story. Uh, armed services. We're sitting in a closed classified briefing uh, on crew
cruise missiles. And uh, the person from the Defense Department discloses to us that they had developed stealth technology that they were going to put on a cruise missile. And lights went off in my head and a couple of my colleagues' heads. Stealth technology? What's that? I mean, it's all in the public domain now. Everybody knows about stealth technology. But then, nobody knew about it. In fact, the person who we asked some follow-up questions, the person told us that they had actually put together a plane, not just a cruise missile, but a plane. <coughs> and they had mounted it on some kind of test rig of some kind. And then they aimed uh, uh, radars at it and uh, couldn't see it. <coughs> and that one day, I remember this because it was really dramatic. One day, this was out, outdoors someplace, obviously. A bird came and sat on top of the plane. And the radar could pick up the bird, but couldn't pick up the plane. Well, lights started going off in our heads because in that hearing, uh, it was at a time when Jimmy Carter was uh, newly the president of the United States, or within, within a few years, uh, and he was trying to make a decision about the B-1 bomber uh, and whether to cancel it or not. And we instantly knew in that hearing that the B-1 bomber was not the latest technology that building it was building an obsolete weapon system for hundreds of millions of billions of dollars. So my colleague Tom Downey and I, we, uh, we demanded to have a full briefing on it. And a most unusual thing happened after that full briefing. A whole host of flag officers, generals in the Air Force, came into our offices and required us to sign a document that we would never disclose what they had told us. Now, members of Congress, by virtue of their election, have top security clearance. Members of Congress can see the topmost secrets of our nation's uh, um, intelligence services without any further prior clearance. So it was extraordinary that they came and asked us to sign a document. Well, we did. But then the thing we did was kind of funny. Zbigniew Brzezinski, if you watch Morning Joe, Nika, his daughter, is one of the, uh, the co-hosts. And she frequently has her father, Zbigniew Brzezinski, on, on as an expert. He was the national security advisor to President. So Tom Downey and I went to Brzezinski and we said, you know, uh, we knew that they were thinking about canceling the B-1 bomber, whether to cancel. And we said, were you aware of stealth technology and how that would eclipse the B-1 bomber, how the, you know, it was going to be obsolete? And Brzezinski said, no, he didn't know anything about it. So he learned about stealth technology from Tom Downey and Bob Carr, who were just junior members. Of, of the Armed Services Committee. And we had happened on something. Now, his own Defense Department hadn't told him. He called up the Secretary of Defense and read the Riot Act at the Secretary of Defense for not telling him about this, because it played heavily into the decision. We had written a paper about this. And when Carter announced that he was canceling the B-1 bomber program, chunks, talk about plagiarism, Chunks of our memo showed up in his statement. I mean, it was, it was a day when we felt we really had made a difference. Not as legislators, per se, not passing laws, not, you know, but we had learned something in our federal government that had an implication for what they were deciding in the White House. The White House didn't have all the facts, and the Pentagon didn't give them all the facts. Why? Because the Pentagon knew that if they told the president about stealth technology, they would be deep-sixing their own favored program, the B-1 program, upon which millions of jobs were, were uh, supposedly at stake and huge sums of money and blah, 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 and defense contractors and the rest. Well, he canceled it, 
And that became a very big issue in the presidential election between Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter. And Ronald Reagan accused Carter of being soft on defense, canceling the B-1 bomber because it was to replace these B-52 bombers that were older than the pilots who flew them and blah, 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 blah. And Carter then tried to defend by saying, well, there's this thing called stealth technology and this, we're not going to build a plane that's going to be obsolete. At which point, all of the hawks came in and, and lambasted Carter for disclosing national secrets to save his political butt. Well, I think he had a right to do that. Well, you know what happened. Carter's defeated. Reagan gets elected. And what do they produce? He turns around the decision and they produce the B-1B. They call it the B-1B. Anybody here know what the B-1B is? Have you ever seen it? They produced hundreds of these things. Obsolete, the day they rolled off the, the assembly line, huge waste of money, lined the pockets of military contractors. And of course, by then, the information about stealth technology is coming out. And oh, we got to build that one too, called the B2B. <coughs> uh, not the B2B, B2. So you see that, I mean, they even threw, flew B-2s over to North Korea the other day, or South Korea. Uh, you know, and the B-1B, they, I don't know what they did. Probably chopped them up. Used them for scrap. So that's, that's some of the interplay that can happen between a member of Congress and, and, and the executive. One of, one of them. Later on, we're going to talk a little bit about the budgetary process and appropriations. But give us a little taste of what it's like being an appropriator. Well, appropriators then were very powerful. Um, you, there's a dividing line in terms of how you ought to think about the Congress. Pre-1995 and post-1995. Pre-1995, committees were powerful. Committee chairs were powerful. You, if you got to be a committee chair, you really did have power. As, a, as chairman of the Transportation Appropriations Committee, I could decide how much money in our country was. I, and and it literally, you know, there's a lot of people working on these projects, so you can't claim sole credit. But every transportation bill started on my desk. Why? Because the art, Article uh, One of the Constitution, which empowers the Congress says that no money shall be spent in the, in the, uh, unless appropriated. So, I mean, the Appropriations Committee comes as close as you can get uh, to being uh, enshrined in the U.S. Constitution. The power of appropriations is the so-called power of the purse. Well, it also says that money bills have to start in the House, not the Senate. It doesn't. <coughs> I mean, there, there, are, there are examples of when that's not observed. But, uh, so in the House, with regard to transportation, the money bill for transportation literally started on my desk. So as the twig is planted, so grows the tree. There's a lot that follows from, it's called a markup. You know, I, I, I produced the bill that spent all the money for transportation. And everything all the way through the Senate to the President's desk was a drop or an ad from what I had started. And of course, as the person who manages that process, I'm in a key position to fight off amendments, to accept amendments. You know, I'm, I'm in a position of deal maker. Huge power. <coughs> members of, members of the, the chairs of the appropriations subcommittees were uh, dubbed cardinals, taking their uh, uh, analogous to the, the cardinals of the Catholic Church. The idea being that the cardinal, the pope is uh, the speaker, and the cardinals are the uh, 
are the, uh, are the uh, appropriations uh, subcommittee chair. Post-1995, that's not, they don't quite live up to that, that 